They make me sick. I'm very happy they don't come to my to my house. You stay away from me. You don't mean anything to me. It's just, uh, but they have to come or, or say something subtle to bring your name up or whatever. To, I have nothing. Uh, uh, what are you trying to say, brother? I really don't feel like making a video as you probably can tell but I just want to get this off my chest I want to I want to rant well what you gonna rant about I want to rant about these unknown faceless pro-black trolls that run around talking about I got your back brother I'm doing something behind the scenes. Y'all know, y'all know the type that I'm talking about. I'm not gonna show my face. Or if I show my face, you know, you know who I am. Now they don't show you their work. They haven't did any work in the past. We don't know what they're doing anything in the present. And we definitely, since there's no work in the past, we can't see no work in the present. So we definitely don't expect nothing in the future. But they claim they are doing this and, and, and doing that. I want to remain unknown. It's none of your business what I'm doing. Most of the time when people tell you it's none of your business what I'm doing, they are not doing anything at all. Now, for me personally, I decided that I wanted to show my face on social media First of all, you know definitely that I am a soul brother. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think this is makeup. So, you know that I am a soul brother. There's no doubt. And I decided to show my face because law enforcement, the government, they already know about me. They have a file. They have my picture, they have my fingerprints, they have my DNA, they know what I'm about, all that, they know about me anyway. And I have no intent to change, nothing, because this is me. I have been concerned with the plight of these who are the descendants of slaves born in America, having dark skin, the people of soul. I have been concerned with our condition, our horrid, pitiful, pathetic condition, ever since I was a little boy when I was first introduced to the teachings of the Nation of Islam as taught by the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Way back when I was seven, eight years old, I, I was you know, I was always an avid reader. I could always read very well. And what I liked about the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, even as a being seven or eight years old, I could understand what the messenger of Allah was teaching in his book, Message to the Black Man, Our Savior Has Arrived, The Fall of America, and all those books that was written by the time uh, I was able, you know, I was coming up in the world. So the government, law enforcement, they know who I am. They know what I'm about. So why sit around here and try to hide? Uh, they know about me. And also, see, 
I use my brain. I come up in a situation situation of incarceration and I learn how to work the devil system. I understand I understand exactly what Malcolm said by any means necessary. Any type of thing in in, in martial arts you take anything. You can take a telephone handle, a broomstick, learn how to make a weapon out of it. That's my type of mentality. You don't understand that. Y'all don't know how to fight. When you fight the enemy, when you, especially in martial arts, you throw a, a punch and you let the enemy know that's where you're going. If you, you fake them out. You make them think that you're going to do this, but you turn around and do something else. Y'all don't know how to fight. Talk about bang on the beast. Fight the white man. And y'all don't know how to fight. You have no idea. You just, you know how girls used to fight? They just <laughs> slinging down. That's how y'all fight. Just any, no kind of organization, no kind of strategy to fight. Just, just hollering and screaming and whatever. You don't holler and scream in martial arts just for the sake of hollering and screaming. You holler and scream in martial arts to fake out your opponents. You holler and scream in martial arts. That gives you that gives you more power in your punch. That's why you see it done in Native Americans. It gives you the gives you that spirit, I guess you could say, to, to fight. Y'all y'all don't have that spirit. You don't have no fight. You don't know how to fight. Mm, mm, mm. Fighting is a strategy. Fighting is a plan. And I really don't care if the if the white man knows about me or what I'm going to do or not. I really don't give a damn because I'm confident in how I fight. I don't care about what they what they think or what they want, what they, what they would do or any of that kind of stuff. It reminds me of that movie Billy Jack. And Billy Jack, I think he was talking to a sheriff, a corrupt sheriff or whatever. And Billy Jack told the sheriff, I'm going to take this right foot and I'm going to bang it against the left side of your face. And there's nothing that you can do. And the, and the sheriff looked at Billy Jack like, yeah, right. I know what you're going to do. I'm going to prevent it. Billy Jack said, I'm going to take this right foot and put it on the left side of your face and there's nothing that you can do and Billy Jack took his right foot put it on the put it on the left side of this guy's face and there was nothing that he can do when you know how to fight when you confident in yourself I don't care what these crackers talking about I don't care what your enemies talk about when you know what you're doing you have confidence in yourself you can tell them, you can tell them what you're gonna do. I'm gonna put you in your damn nose. There's nothing that they can do. Then it's done. But y'all don't know how to fight. So I go back to these cats, these faceless people keep telling me. I have had faceless trolls come to me ever since at least 2008, and they keep telling me, oh. Uh, Keep talking, brother. Uh, we got your back. We belong to a secret, like a secret organization undercover. And we doing things undercover. Well, since that time, Trayvon Martin has been murdered. The little boy with the gun murdered. How many of our people have been senselessly murdered, strangled, all kinds of stuff? Where are, where are all these faces... Why is there no retribution? Why haven't you punished these people? You undercover. You, you doing stuff secretly. Why aren't you doing anything to show our enemies that there is some type of secret, secret organization, some type of secret society? When you hurt black folks, y'all, there's a price to pay. They haven't done anything. So really, I mean, so don't come to me with that. Uh, I'm doing, I'm doing something secret. Uh, don't, don't tell the enemy what you're going. That's because you're not doing nothing anyway. Now I do understand. There's a place for that. 
See, because I'm not going to go around and actually tell these suckers what I plan to do, when I'm going to do it, or anything like that. See, that's just for show. Because I want to be arrogant. I want to show you. If I want to punch you in your face, I'm going to tell you, and there's nothing that you can do with it. But that don't mean you fight the whole war like that. That's you are that's you are you an idiot. That's not how you do it. I understand being covert. I understand acting on what's subterfuge. I understand being secretive. I understand all that. Having the element of surprise on your side. I understand that. However, at the same time, we know and you know that you're doing absolutely nothing. So all these evils since 2008, all these faceless trolls on media, social media, they run around, these faceless people claiming what they're they doing something secret. I'm doing something undercover. You ain't doing a damn thing. And the proof is in the pudding. Where is it? Let's just see the action. There are no actions to say, wow, there's some type of secret uh, society or even an individual that's doing this and doing that. It's not happening. You have an individual talking about, uh, I don't have to tell y'all what I'm doing because you're doing nothing. The reason why you can't tell about what you're doing because you, you're not doing nothing, period. You, you didn't do nothing in 1964. You didn't do nothing in 1974. You ain't did nothing. The only thing they do is come to social media, sit on their ass. When I was growing up in the nation of Islam, you could not sit on your ass and do nothing. You was expected to go out in the street, sell those newspapers, spread the information and that knowledge in person. You could not sit on your lazy ass on a couch eating cheeseburgers talking about what you're doing. Then some of these people, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching alcoholics how to be better. I'm doing this for, I'm doing this for the little children. That has nothing to do. If you don't belong to an organization, if you're not doing nothing at, as part of an organization, the little things that you're doing, it's beneficial. We cut your hands for the for the good that you might bring to to, to individuals. But we as a so-called people, it means absolutely nothing. You're dealing with a group of people, so you need a group action in order to cause this condition to change. Individual actions, most times, cannot change a condition unless that individual can affect the group. Not one or two or three people uh, in your neighborhood. It's not going to work. So we really need to, y'all faceless trolls, you need to go somewhere else with that crap because you don't impress me. I'm doing something secret undercover. And I will say this before I close. If you would support and join this ministry, I'll guarantee you that it won't take long. You, you will see a real change of condition of the masses of a people. See, you don't concentrate on the whole. You concentrate on spots first. You don't sit around here, I'm going to solve, I'm going to change the condition of the United States. Start with Chicago, say for instance. And you work your magic in Chicago. Chicago would be the shining example of what can be done in Baltimore, St. Louis, Fort Lauderdale and wherever we live. But I'm going to travel the country. I'm going to travel the world. You, you're going to try to fix the world, but you have not fixed Chicago. You have not fixed St. Louis. But you travel the world and people love me all over the world, but you ain't fixed nothing. The only thing you done was go on vacation. <laughs> And the subject that I've chosen is our right to abort a child, our right 
to abort our life. Abortion. The abortion of, of, of unborn children, the abortion, our own abortion of our own personal life. We want to talk about this very quickly. So, um, put on your helmets. Let's not try to be emotional. Let us really think about this. And before I begin, I want to say and make very clear that I do not advocate. I do not advocate abortion. I do not support abortion. I do not advocate assisted suicide. I don't support it. Those things, I don't encourage abortion. I don't encourage assisted suicide and all these different things. However, However, I feel, and nobody outside of me has the right to tell me what to do if I'm a woman. Nobody has the right to tell me what I should and should not do with my body. This is my life. This is not yours. Who the hell are you? If I'm sick, or if I'm just sick of living, I'm tired of the foolishness of this supposed to be life. Who are you to tell me I don't have the right to take my life? I, I want out of here. This is my life. This is not yours. You do what you want to do. I do not like people trying to tell others what to do with something they did not create. You did not create my life. How are you going to tell me? Who the hell are you to tell me what I should and should not do? You do your thing with your life. I am the one who survived out of thousands of sperm. I was able to make it to the egg and I began to evolve and then I came into this world. Mind you, I did not ask to be here. Mind you, I had nothing to do with my, I did not look at this world and say, wow, I sure wish I could come into that life thing. I don't like being a sperm. I sure would like to meet an egg and, and come into, I had no choice. Next thing I know, I'm in this mess with you. And here you are trying to tell me what to do with my life. Now, of course, many of us have a religious background when it comes to abortion and assisted suicide. And if you're going to take your life, I think it should be the humane thing to do that a doctor use his skills to give you some sleeping pills or some kind of anesthesia or whatever they do in medicine. And allow you to go out in a peaceful manner instead of hiding down in the basement, chugging down a bunch of pills, taking a gun and blow your brains out, or whatever. If a woman is thinking about aborting her child, you just want to blame the woman. If a person is thinking about suicide, the only thing we do is look at the woman. We don't look at our society and the world we live in in general. You just want to blame the woman and you just want to blame the individual. They just weak. Uh, 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 she she should have never messed with that thug and all this other mess. You don't want to look at general society that creates situations and creates these these things going to war and I'm surrounded by death and destruction and it keeps plaguing my mind this is not normal a war situation caused this person to begin to think like that it's called trauma when a woman listen when a woman decides she wants to kill her child 
Something is abnormal. Something is wrong. She's suffering from some kind of trauma. When a person decides, I don't want to live no longer. I'm tired of this life. Something has happened. Some type of trauma. And if they feel as though they can't get help or it's just hopeless, who are you to say and tell them, uh, you need to stay here with us. That's, that's, that's the easy way out. It's not easy to want to die. Where y'all getting that from? It's not easy to sit around. You have to become very, very out of your mind. Something has happened to you to make you want to murder yourself. It is against nature. And you never see in nature where animals purposely try to murder and kill themselves. That is abnormal behavior. Trauma has happened. And instead of focusing on the individual, we should be focusing on the cause. Even so, you don't have and I don't have the right to tell somebody when they are fed up or if a woman has a, a baby she does not want, she knows she's not going to get any help from a father. The father does not want the baby either. Who are we to tell anybody not to abort the child and we're not going to do anything with the child? Look at all the babies that are in orphanages and foster homes. No child should be in a foster home. No child should be in an orphanage. Some adults, some families should always be able to step up and adopt these children. But you don't. Then you turn around, abortion is evil, it's against God. But you won't adopt God's children. Y'all, hypocrisy is fake. Religion said that it's the cowardly way. I don't give a dang what religion say. Religion has caused all kinds of murder, religious-based wars and destruction and hatred all over. I could care less about what religion talking about. Religion said that it's cowardly. You leaving your family and your friends and they're going to be upset. They can get over it. If I decided to commit suicide and you love me, you, you would get over it. So what? This is my life. It's nice knowing you. I came into this world alone. And I will leave alone. I just know you for a brief moment in time. And that's, and that's a fact. We are all alone. We are on this journey alone. However, if you wish to be a little humane, assist me with my suicide, doctor. I didn't ask to be here. I don't want none of this. I'm forced to live in a society that is the cause of abortion. Here you are, you live in a society, fornication and adultery is legal. One of the consequences, one of the results of fornication is adult, adultery is unwanted children. The society is causing these things. People can't get what they want. They feel hopeless in this society. You shouldn't have to work so hard. The society is filthy rich and you have people in, the, in a society that's filthy rich always struggling trying to survive. What sense do that make? You live in a society that causes abortion and causes people to think in a suicidal manner. Filled with liars, you greedy, you nasty, you profane. You fake. You act like you care, but you really don't. And you want somebody to sit around here when they are fed up and sit around here and bear with it. When a person is sick and they feel all this pain day in and day out, they get to the point, I can't tolerate it. Shouldn't they have the right? I can't take this no more. My bones is all brittle and I'm feeling pain. I'm sick. I'm throwing up blood every day. I can't take this no more. I want out of this. And you are not humane enough to say, okay, we helped you lead this life. 
It was nice knowing you and everything, and we say our goodbyes. And allow that person to pass this life and get and hopefully get out of this suffering and this pain. They do it with animals. They do it with dogs and horses. But you won't do it with a person. Why? But at the same time, you turn around, who's going to pay this medical bill? That's what's on your mind. Who's going to pay the medical bill? Why these people are suffering? Do you get Medicaid? What kind of insurance do you have? Many times, the only reason why we want to keep folks alive so that we can make as much money off of them as possible. See, the society creates suicidal thinking. The society has created abortion. It's not the individual. We should help a person instead of hinder a person when, the, when suffering has gotten to the point they just, I just can't, I can't do this no more. I hurt too much. Let them go like you would do a horse and a cow and a dog. Have This is called having mercy. Give them some type of pill or shoot some type of uh, substance in your vein and let them go to sleep and get out of this. Again, I don't advocate these things. However, I will not deny a person a right to do with their life. This is mine. To do with your life what you feel you want to do. You have the right. The only right you should have is trying to talk somebody out of abortion. Trying to talk somebody out of suicide. Then you must offer them something. And many of you, the only thing you do is talk. You don't offer something, an alternative. And when it comes to suffering and pain and I'm hurting every day, there is no alternative. I want out of this. People should be allowed assisted suicide, help to get out of this thing. And you claim many of them are going to heaven. There's an afterlife. So why are you keeping people here? When clearly it's time for us to go. Well, that's my position on that issue. We should have the right. This is this is your life. I'm not going to tell you what to do with your life. It does not affect me. You die, you have an abortion. It has no effect on, on me. So what, why are y'all upset? You should be upset with the society that causes these things and straighten that up. But that would be too simple and easy, right? This is why this is a rap video. Because I get sick of talking. But also when we talk about, well, we need to take actions. We need to provide real solutions. The problem is actions take too much work. We really don't want to do the work. And we really don't accept and want anything to do with real solution. Because... Real solutions and real work interferes with our being comfortable in our oppression. We just like to complain. That's all you see all over YouTube. It's nothing but Negroes and their complaint. Because really, that's their way of tolerating the oppression that they know exists but they really don't want to do nothing about it. But when they complain, when they watch a video, when they talk about it, it makes them feel as though they have done something to try to change the condition when in fact you have done absolutely nothing.
This is why the car is still at point A when it should be at point B. It has not moved at all. You refuse to move. And the reason why you refuse to move is because you're comfortable and you're feeling good. Some of you, y'all do drugs, you smoke weed, you drink alcohol, you snort cocaine. That's your way of feeling good. Some of you get high on the black scholarship, these teachings. The next video by Louis Farrakhan, the next video by... The house of consciousness, Sarah Susan said it polite. You waiting on that. That's how you get your high. You become a drug addict. And drug addicts have never done anything to change a condition or move the world. A drug addict is sick. They are suffering from a self-inflicted disorder. What we want to talk about real quick is... Basically, I'm asking the question, do you want to be just a comfortable slave or do you want true liberation? Do you absolutely, for real, want to be free of your oppressor? Make up your mind. Don't be ashamed. If you are a comfortable Negro, if I was a comfortable Negro, I would just tell you, say, look, man, uh, I live pretty decent, uh, got two houses, got a car. Uh, got a degree on the wall. I'm doing pretty fine. You know, the white man is bad, but I, I can deal with it. No, no big deal. I wish y'all the best of luck in your black power stuff. But I'm a comfortable, I'm a comfortable, I'm a comfortable Negro, and I'm satisfied with that. So just admit it. Don't sit around here, black power family. And if you want a white woman, just say, look, I want me a white woman. Don't sit around here, black power family, and all this stuff. And you really are comfortable. In your oppression, you don't, I mean, you actually are happy living this way. Because if you wasn't happy, if you was really dissatisfied, you would change this condition. It's simple as that. But you're not really trying to change your condition because you're actually satisfied and comfortable in your oppression. Do you want to be a comfortable Negro or do you want to be liberated for real? This is what I represent. But I don't get the support. So don't blame me. You want to be comfortable Negro. You can't accept your reality. You can't accept the real truths. And until you accept reality, until you accept real truths, you're going to remain in your fantasy, delusional, comfortable Negro slave condition. That's just the bottom line. And you can holler and scream at me all you want to, and you can complain. But when you wake up in the morning, that's all that you are, a comfortable Negro. And you can holler black power, black conscious. I'm a pan-African. I'm a pan-African. You can, you can be a pan, whatever the hell you want to. You're a pan-African, comfortable Negro slave. That's all that you are. So we have this feel-good concept of saving the, the black boys. It feels good. What is the benefit? Is there really a benefit? What is, here you are, wasting your time, wasting your resources for something that is going, that's going to give very little benefit, unless, of course, you are the author, you are the creator of the movement that's trying to save the black boys. You know, you can go all over the world, and you, you live comfortable, and people praising you. It's good for you, but when it's all said and done, this is not going to do nothing for us as a so-called people. It's not. In fact, instead of trying to save the black boys, you should be concerned with saving all the children and not be prejudiced and biased to none of our babies. I have a relative, a small child, female, in my family, and she's on the verge of being put in the psycho stuff, a being diagnosed ADHD and all that psycho garbage. Dr. Umar Johnson is familiar, he knows what the deal is. Because, see, she is so hype, and it's not the fact that she's crazy, or whatever. Her mind is racing, she needs something, she needs something that can 
tame her mind. She's curious, she's active, she's physical, and the education that she's getting is not able to do that. So she's crazy. She's out of control. So the first thing we want to do is tranquilize the children. I agree with a lot of what Dr. Umar Johnson talks about. Sure do. Dr. Umar Johnson talks about it. I guess he has a certain amount of education in it, but I also lived it. So I'm not telling you things from what I read or, or whatever. I'm telling you because I live the psycho insane world. I lived it. So they want to make my little relative crazy, just like the boys you want to save. So why don't we save the children? And when you're talking about saving the black boys, don't your boys have to eat? Whose food are they going to eat? Are they going to be eating Pan-African food? The boys have to be in housing. Who's going to build the house? Who's going to maintain the house? Africans? Pan-Africanists? They have to be clothed, wear clothes. Are they wearing the clothes of the Africans and or the black folks or, or whatever? So here you are trying to say to black boys, you want to give the boys an image of black solidarity and, and, and Africanness and all this kind of stuff, but yet they still getting food from up out of the white man's, the pink man's table. Still wearing Jordans and all this other stuff. And then the, and, and the housing, the building was probably built originally by pink folks. Was nothing built by black hands. So when they know all these different things, here you are, you're talking all this black stuff, but yet it's still, y'all still white as snow. So then when the black boys that are yours that you're trying to save are growing up to be men and they are ready to get a job, where the jobs coming from? The job should be available right now, but they're not. So you are preparing, you're saving the black boys. So are you saving the black boys for yourself, for the purpose of Pan-Africanism, or are you saving the black boys for the benefit of your slave master and anybody else who gets a hold of them because you don't have no job, you don't grow no food, you don't have no land, you don't have nothing. You still a beggar, a beggar that can educate your children. And the only thing they're going to do is end up in the hands of your enemy. In fact, why are we trying to focus on saving the children, which that sounds good and it feels good. But don't you know that you was a you was a children at one time? Why don't we focus on saving the adults? Because when you save the adults, when you can provide food, clothing, and shelter for the adults, save the adults, make the adults feel proud of who they are, make the adults use their hands, use their brain to change their condition. When you change the adults, you will save the children because the adults will do what is proper for what is in the best interest of the children. You don't have to specify we're going to save the black boys. That sounds good. Like we're going to save the puppies because the puppies are nice and cute. Puppies grow up to be dogs but we don't like the dog. It's all about the puppy. It should be about saving the adults because the adults will save the children. But when you don't do that and you have not disconnected the adults from the enemy and the, the adults still depend upon the enemy that you're trying to save your children from. If there's no disconnection, then your saving of the children is, is, is not worth it. It's a waste of time because the only thing you've done, I mean, there's some benefit to it, but they, they're going to be influenced by the enemy that you fail to disconnect from. And they end up the same old comfortable Negro slave like you and I 
have become and what we were born into. And then we have somebody, again, going back to Dr. Umar Johnson, who has yet to transform himself. Many of you are familiar with the rant that he did against uh, soul brother Sarah Sudan and the real nigga. See, the real nigga is still in him. It has not gone anyway. You have to work on yourself. You have to, what's the sense of saving the boys when the boys look still look up to you as an example and they still see you, you are nigga. You nigga trash. And I MF this, and you still perpetuating, and you still promoting the words, these racist words and behaviors that you learn from being a slave and watching and being influenced by your masa. So, so how are you saving the boys when niggas is teaching the boys? Who should be teaching the boys? Who should be the example of the boys is one who is striving, able to control yourself. So even though you want to cuss, don't do it in front of the boys. Don't let the boys know that you still a nigga. When the boys see you, they see what many of y'all call, they see God. But you can't control yourself. You have not transformed yourself. You just an idiot. You can't even, you can't even compose yourself to the point where in front of the children, you can't behave like you're a civilized human being. You show, you show the boy that you're still a nigga. You show the boy that you're still a whoremonger. You talk about that you love the boys, but behind closed doors, you're trying to get in their mama's pants. What kind of examples are you trying to set to talking about we saving the boys? So what is the benefit of all this? There is no benefit to it at all, except it's more feel good stuff. And see, if that's all you want to do is feel good, then I am very happy that you stay the hell away from the house of real truth because I'm not about that. I am about accepting the reality of our situation and changing our condition. You cannot be perfect. That's true. But we can try. You're not even trying to, to be better. You find, you find some type of pleasure being a nigga. Me. This is not about the prophet of doom. This is not about, and shouts out to uh, the mad headhunter, uh, that brother. Um, this is not about individuals. This is about the acceptance of reality so that we can deal with this in an adult and realistic manner and get all this stuff on our plate off so that we can have a decent meal without all these trimmings that mean nothing, all these garnish that really don't mean nothing. It makes the food look pretty, but we're not looking for pretty food. We're looking for food that can bring the body nutritional value. So it is important that this is not about myself and individual. It is about us coming together using our brains. It is impossible for me to know everything. It is impossible for the prophet of truth. It is a, it's a doom. It is impossible for any of us as an individual to know it all. However, when you have brains, plural, not a brain, when you have brains looking at things from so many sides and that brain is operating properly, then you have better of a chance to come up with a real and clear solution to a problem that should have been solved a long time ago. But because we're not using our brains, you are following a brain. You follow Umar Johnson, you follow Sarah Sutton said, are you following uh, 
That's why on YouTube, who are you following? Who are you subscribed to? You follow Pastor Mud Flapping, Pastor Chicken Wing, and Reverend Chicken Wing, and y'all followers, and you're not using your brain. This is a problem that needs brains power, plural. I do not know it all. I never say I know it all. I would be a liar to you to tell you I know it all. However, I can sincerely and honestly come to you and say I know the foundation. I know the base of where our thinking should be coming from so that we can solve this problem once and for all so that our future generations, our babies, can live and walk the path much better than ourselves and perhaps we can go down in history and be looked upon by them as the greatest generation that was ever produced because we learned how to use our brains brains plural so I think the heavens I think the universe for the existence of the brother prophet of doom and uh, the mad uh, head hunter I think I think I'm saying that right and so many others we should really be joined together just like those who are guiding our people in a wrong direction we who bring reality should be joined together and come up as a team and unite and bring what we have to the table so that the people can see real light, a true light, a true sun, not a night light, not a headlight, but the actual sun that brings light and life to this planet. And without that sun, there will be no life. We bring reality. We are the true givers of life. Now, with that said, let's talk about is civilization good or bad? This talk is inspired again by my brother, Prophet of Doom. I always give credit where credit is due. Always. People talk about I plagiarize and I steal this and that. That's a lie. I have no problem. I love when I quote from the Bible, I say it comes from the Bible. When I talk about something from the Quran, or Umar Johnson said this, or I got this from Sarah Subhanahu or Don Cornelius, whoever, I have no problem like with that. It's a beautiful thing to me. I love information. I love when people are telling the truth, telling something that makes sense. Regardless to the vessel. I'm not interested in the vessel. What I am interested in is the truth. You should not be interested in whether you like me or not. You should be interested in does what I am bringing, does what prophet of doom, is it making sense? And you really can't say if it makes sense or not if you have not tried it. One thing for sure. Everything else that you have tried has failed. It failed in the past. It continues to fail. You look insane trying to put a square peg in a round hole. With that said, I have about nine minutes left. Let me see if I can go through this very quickly and raise some questions. And let's talk about this. Civilization. What are you saying? First part of the word, civil. Do we understand what civil means? Look it up. I don't, we don't have time to really explain what civil means. But cordial, respectful. We're civil. Nonviolent, civil. Civilization or nation. What you're talking about is a civil nation. Civilization. Now the thing about a civilization, for those of you who study history and to my knowledge, you can always correct me, but to my knowledge, to what I have heard and from what I have studied, that which is called a civilization was not born 
out of civility. It was born out of violence. That's how civilizations come. That's how nations are formed. I don't know any nation in history that was not a great nation. A great nation we're talking about. We're talking about great civilizations. Great civilizations were never established in a civil manner. It was always by some type of violence. However, you don't see, I mean, you see violence, but you don't see this type of behavior in what we call primitives and the savages. Now, is civilization good or bad? If you were born living in mud, and that's all that you know, you think that living in mud is normal. Living in mud is not normal. However, if you were born in mud, and living in mud is all you know, as far as you're concerned, then it's normal. If you were born, if you was an infant born in jail with your mother, she was in prison and you was born in jail, and they allow the baby to stay with the child's mother, and bars and prison life, jail life is all that child knows. It is normal. But we know that living in mud, being institutionalized, living in prison, that's not normal. So it is with civilization. We think that civilization is a good thing. We got computers. We have cars. We, go, we, can, we might be going to the moon. All this kind of stuff. Fantastic. We're not, we're not the primitives. We're not like the savages. We have, we have established civilization. But just because you live in this great civilization, you believe that it's normal because it is all you know. When it seems as though the reality is that civilization, I don't care if it's a great black civilization, European civilization, I don't care what the civilization is. It looks like civilization is abnormal. It's abnormal because, first of all, like I say, it, no, no civilization was born, established due to being civil. Now you have those who have these religious ideas where way back millions of years they did this and that. We don't know nothing about that. Oh, that's, that's hearsay, fantasy. We don't know nothing about it. If it was true, why do you have what you have today? The reason why you have dark skin right now is because somebody a long, long time ago, they had dark skin. If there was civilization rooted and based in civility a long time ago, why wouldn't it exist right now? All the civil, great civilizations that we know of, and you read in your history books, they were established by violence, nothing civil. So you live in this civilization, and we have all this technology, just like I explained, the, the gun and nuclear weapons and, and, and light bulbs and all this wonderful stuff that we think. And we think that is wonderful and fantastic because this is all that we know. But just because this is how we live does not make it normal. I will say that again. Just because we live in civilization and we think that this is how we live and it's great does not make it normal. What comes along with civilization? What comes along with civilization is cities. When you have cities, you have people that are crowded. What happens? When we put mice in a situation where they are crowded, when mice are put in a situation where they are crowded or, am, or any animal or anything, when they are crowded, violence, abnormal behaviors start coming up out of the people. And this is what you begin to see in your civilizations because cities are formed. You have these crowds and violence and all kinds of abnormal behaviors, a drunkenness and all types of things. The abnormal becomes the normal in civilization.
what is taken away in civilization is the right for the people to be able each listen each individual has the right to be independent so that you can take care of yourself you should be able to go out in the forest and kill a deer pick an apple off a tree you should not be dependent upon an unnatural source but that's what civilizations do they cause an unnatural way of life where the independent person the independent family depends upon what the civilization has created and it is abnormal because the people cannot take care of themselves the people begin or must take care of themselves due to what is provided by civilization and the technology of civilization although the computer is wonderful everything looks beautiful technology has side effects it has waste and the waste just by looking at your computer screen all the time you are damaging your eyes the car you drive is throwing poison uh, uh, elements in the air that you breathe and the airplanes and this technology the weapons of technology used not only for your benefit but the same technology is used to murder and destroy and kill civilization just because you live in it you think that is normal but that's not necessarily so civilizations are built upon a foundation or thrive on a foundation that is perishable the the source that if that civilization feeds upon I don't care if it's black civilization or whatever the civilization feeds upon non-renewable sources and creates a lot of waste that poisons the very citizens that civilizations uh, that the, the population within the civilization so you have civilizations that have actually fallen great civilizations have actually fallen because they were unable to feed the citizens then you have civilizations that is just conquered by greater civilizations but they are all still based on the same premise they are founded and rooted and thrive upon perishable resources and they and they uh, <clears throat> and they cause poisonous waste however and civilizations they come and they go due to these facts however you have people right now who are savages who are primitives many of them have remained unchanged for thousands if not millions of years but your great civilization they come and they go within those who live within a in civilizations who have this type of mindset they believe that there's a never-ending